Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me this morning. We're going to uh, take a look at lesson eight. And a uh, big part of that is the plant system design. So that should be an enjoyable uh, topic to dive into today with everyone. So let us uh, briefly take a look at the assignment and uh, we can then take a peek at any questions anybody has, as well as the, uh, I have some examples here I can show you and uh, we will get right at it here. All right. Yeah, so here we are at lesson eight. And uh, now we're in kind of our, our full swing with some design work uh, in the course. And we're going to be starting with uh, the local plant survey and then moving on to this plant system design. So the local plant survey, as you can see, is uh, worth four points and the plant system design is worth 14. So you can see where most of your time and energy is going to be spent. Uh, the local plant survey is pretty, pretty um, straightforward. I don't know if anyone has any questions on that, but uh, basically what we're doing here is we're just looking for five native or uh, naturalized plants in your area that are medicinal, what they're used for, and what part of that plant. And this is actually a fascinating uh, assignment. I always uh, really enjoy going through students' uh, assignments with this. Uh, it, it's truly amazing what um, medicinal plants are out there and even a lot that uh, I've used in the past as an ornamental. I've discovered that have some uh, some ornamental property or sorry, <laughs> medicinal properties. Um, so yeah, that's really uh, very, very interesting. Um, I would encourage everybody to to dive into uh, medicinal plants uh, in the future and just, just to learn more about what's around you in terms of medicine and sort of preventative uh, medicine as well. Um, so with that, we are looking also for... Uh, have you used any of these plants before personally? And we want to have a list of uh, wild foods that um, historically were eaten during each season. Um, and that's a little bit of a, a funny one. We, uh, my household eats very much seasonally. Uh, we grow all our own uh, vegetables um, and access meats from you know, small producers locally. But um, we certainly eat uh, uh, very much seasonally. And if you, know, you start doing that, you really uh, discover that that's uh, the, the body um, enjoys seasonal foods uh, versus whatever uh, you can get at the supermarket, let's say, which is basically uh, <laughs> just about everything all year round. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's, it's very interesting to shift a little bit and to see the results of that. So Maggie has a question here, historically eaten in our regions. Yeah, so that would um, you'd be kind of looking back at um, either homesteaders or aboriginals in the area and what they might have eaten, you know, at this time of year, say fall. What, uh, what would be something that um, uh, First Nations people would eat during the fall in this area or in your area. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we're also looking for plant nurseries and four farms in your area. So this, this is a fairly straightforward section. Uh, and here is the rubric, which I encourage everybody to take a look at just to make sure they're including everything that we're asking for. And I, I, this is the guide that I use when I'm doing any of the grading. So that uh, is a critical piece. 
But the, the big part of the assignment is the plant system design. So we're now going to dive into um, an opportunity to get to play with some plants, uh, albeit on paper. Um, but uh, there are a few things that we want you to, to keep in mind. And one of them is uh, hopefully if your pro if your project site has some existing plants in it, which uh, many of yours will, uh, we want you to try and focus on sort of building around those. Um, you don't have to. If there's nothing on your site, not to worry. You can just uh, place something there that you would. But what I'm looking for, and I, I would hope that everybody would be sort of drawn towards is this whole idea of having multiple layers, okay, in your planting. So that tree, shrub, herbaceous, ground cover, um, could be climbers in there, could be also tubers, you know, blow ground root. Um, if what you'll probably find is when you get those various layers in place in a landscape, that the ecological footprint goes way up. All of a sudden, it is attractive to uh, a lot of different insects and a lot of different birds because they have cover, uh, as opposed to having things very open and um, uniform. So, you know, traditional, some traditional landscapes may have, um, and certainly we see this in commercial landscapes where you have you know, probably trees and then some shrubs in place and uh, very little herbaceous uh, elements are used typically. Um, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind and I'll show you a few photos as we go here. Um, so that is the biggie, how all these plants interact. And I've, I've been asked before what my favorite plant is, and that's something that um, I've never been able to answer because I don't really look in the landscape at individuals. I see how they're, they're interacting together. And that, I think, is a healthy approach. Um, we want to try and blend these various layers and then plants within those layers to yield the best results. So what are those results? Well, that, that would entirely depend upon the designer, what they're trying to uh, pull off here, whether it's, uh, you know, strictly to support the ecological um, footprint or um, whether it's aesthetic, uh, whether you're trying to do this for production. And that gets more into farm scale you know, when we're looking at that or market garden scale, that's not often in our uh, smaller urban spaces, but these are things you want to consider. Now, per personally, I like all the above. <laughs> I'd love to create habitat uh, as well as an aesthetic uh, value to it and get some production out of it. So again, the more you can uh, consider uh, the better without overthinking it. So what we're hoping to do is get two individual plants of similar structure. And um, that could be a fruit tree. Uh, really depends on your project site. The larger the project site, actually, the larger those individuals might be uh, on an urban uh, property, it might be uh, dwarf trees, or it could be large shrubs. Um, whatever you feel is going to work. And then what we want to do is take those two individuals and then start adding in and around them. Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples a little bit later. But um, Again, it's these various habitat zones that we're trying to establish. And uh, if you look, if you're, if you're in, well, let's say we're all in the Pacific Northwest here, most of us, if we are looking at uh, the forest, at the edge of the forest, you are going to see just that. You're going to have this huge canopy layer and it's going to start coming down in height, right? right to the bottom. So very little of that space is actually uh, 
unoccupied. Um, and an awful lot of times you'll find that uh, if you do establish habitat in that way, you'll have a bit of a crossover with some of the ecology, um, which is a, a benefit. And let's see here. So in the instructions, we were hoping that at least one plant, one of these individual plants exists on your site. And then we're going to kind of build around that. So that'll be probably the case for most of you. Uh, I know I'm trying to remember who on the call here has a, a new home. Not sure if it's Hollis. Maybe I'm wrong on that one. <laughs> Anyways, a, a new build uh, with very little existing. So you're going to have to, you know, create um, create your primary plants. And let's see some of the other things to consider. So this is a good uh, good part of the assignment to go through. So what ecological services do these primary species provide for the surrounding environment? What are the functions provided by other plants? And that could be pretty broad and a lot of it we probably don't aren't even aware of. Um, what yields will come for to humans and what have we placed each plant in its chosen, why have we placed each plant in its chosen position? And that may be kind of hard to, um, to answer. Uh, I know when I started in this, uh, in, in the landscape industry and I started doing my own plantings after working for years with others, um, I would do things and I don't, I don't know if I could have actually told you why it was more of a, a feel, uh, when I was planting, laying things out. So don't, don't get too worried if you get, uh, stuck on some of these little points here, just do your best to work through those. Uh, one thing you do want to consider is if you have some fruit trees, yeah, fruit trees in particular, uh, you definitely want to allow for some space around them for pruning, for harvesting, uh, while still adding a little bit of uh, a component uh, around them. So it's a little bit of a dance with those. Uh, if it is for aesthetic only, then it is quite easy. You don't really have to worry about access so much. There is... Uh, a note here about designing by subtraction. And this is just one thing that you could consider and take a look at. Um, when you're dealing with plants themselves, you know, some plants are really quite strong in the landscape. Uh, an example of that might be a globe artichoke, right? So you can place an, a globe artichoke in the landscape on its own, and it's extremely bold, right? Very bold foliage, very early to come up out of the ground. Uh, in fact, they're, you know, very active right now uh, until we get some hard weather. There's others that are, are weaker in terms of their foliage, so you you often want to add more of those and those would be sort of grouped uh, an example might um, might be uh, cat mint or nepeta um, drop more which is a, a fairly low little nepeta very good edger and uh, just one in the landscape really wouldn't cut it uh, you know aesthetically but well or ecologically but if you have many say drifting along an edge of a, a garden, uh, that tends to be a much more effective uh, display. And then we get into curve, curve linear rows. So we're gonna layer plants by height. And I would say if, if nothing else, you know, that is one of the big takeaways, right? Is to include these various layers, as many as you can, 
uh, not as many plants, but as many layers as you can in a given space. So sometimes we're going to have really awkward, small beds. Uh, for us, for my wife and myself, when we create uh, landscapes for people and we're designing, we have kind of a minimum of four foot with a depth of any one bed. So you might have a really long, narrow bed. Try not to get it below four feet in width because the narrower you go with it, uh, you'll discover the less you can do with it. Even if it's very long, it's still... Um, you still need a certain amount of space to create these various layers and all these layers from an aesthetic standpoint play into um, this whole idea of, of trying to create year-round interest. And the year-round interest can be, you know, you could say, well, that's for, for our pleasure, but it can also uh, uh, be for ecological improvement. So there's more habitat available. And a solar bowl or a focus on solar access. So you might have uh, a beautiful little microclimate that, um, uh, for instance, where I live, we have a few little spots, particularly in the fall, that get uh, late day sun and they're just wonderful to sit in and sit around. And they'd also be really good for um, some of those hard to grow plants like, um, well, like olive. Uh, there's a few varieties of olive that can do well in, the, in where I live. And um, you, But to do it, you'd need that special, kind of special spot for it. So, all right. And then how they're going to support each other and minimize work. So I can definitely show you some images about that. And then what we definitely, it would be a great uh, idea for everybody to get into the habit of using botanical or scientific names for plants rather than uh, common names. Um, that way, you know, uh, you're identifying um, that plant exactly. A, a, let's say an example of that would be, say you're doing a little planting and you say, well, I want to put a rose here. Um, well, it would be better to be very specific with that. So maybe that's uh, uh, Rosa Ragosa, right? That sort of thing. So that you know exactly uh, what you are, well, your client will know exactly what you're referring to. And there are some resources here you can take a look at. Um, and some of the elements that we've got. So the first element is we, again, want sort of existing conditions. So we want to see your base plan uh, in that 2D overhead view. And we want a statement of purpose. So why are you doing this? What's the, what's the goal? And on your base map, you want to indicate where the area is that you're going to be uh, focused on with this exercise. So this is a sort of baby step forward in terms of a full planting plan. Okay, so let me just show you what I mean. I want to stop that. All right, so this... This is an example of a planting plan that we did for, and I'm not really going to get into the specifics here with you today, but I am going to show you that this, wherever we have designated uh, a, a soft landscape area, that is where we have placed plants, right? So we're not asking you to do something like this in lesson number eight, but maybe in lesson number eight, you would you would do something, let me just get my drawing tool going. You might, uh, you know, choose an area that size, right? Doesn't have to be huge. Um, yeah, I guess in uh, hindsight, 
it would probably be maybe just this whole bed. That would probably be easier. And if we look at that bed, we can see that it has a number of different types of symbols in it. So we have a tree symbol. And then we have these shrub symbols here. And then we have these smaller herbaceous symbols. Okay. And in this situation, this is really for aesthetic only. We're not trying to create a medicinal garden here. Um, let's see here. But what we're doing is we are creating these various layers in the landscape. Now, because we're close to our client's house here, we didn't want to start plugging this up with a bunch of trees. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of these existing trees already here. So there's one here and we have dotted trees on the other side of this driveway area and then underplanted it as well. So for, for lesson number eight, we want to focus on trying to get as many layers as possible within your area, right? So it doesn't have to be very big. Uh, you could even make it this size right here, right? That would be totally fine. As long as you can fit as much, like in this case, there would be no tree layer, but there is a shrub. Uh, there's four shrubs in here and then a herbaceous layer below it. Now, there's no fence or trellis behind it, but that would be easy if we had that to then get some climbing elements going up. And that adds another layer. Often we, you know, it, it's funny, we always uh, erect um, support for climbers, but in the wild uh, or in their native habitats, climbers end up going up into uh, shrubs and trees. So it's actually quite beautiful to see. Um, so we are a little bit limited on what we're doing there. Um, let me just... So lesson number eight, given what we're doing with it, is to really eventually move you along so you could create a full planting plan like this, right? But this is sort of a baby step in that direction. Now, <laughs> these aren't easy, I must say. When I, uh, I was an apprentice for four years and then a, a journeyman gardener and I worked in England for a while. And so lots of on the ground, hands-on experience. And when I started to do residential landscapes, I could not create a landscape on paper. I didn't have that ability. So what I would do, I had a really strong plant knowledge. So I would, ascend, I would just get a whole bunch of plants that I loved and bring them onto the site. And I would know approximately how many of those larger trees and shrubs I was going to use just by the, the amount of space I had to work with, but I would bring in extra material and I would just lay it all out. Um, you know, it was all very visual Had not nothing planned on paper. Now there's a lot of disadvantages to that. Uh, I couldn't do anything otherwise at that time. So I had to be a little bit patient with myself. And, uh, once I learned a little bit more about the whole design process and the advantage of doing something like this ahead of time. Um, yeah, it was, it was much better. So this is all we do now is do all of our planting layouts on paper and then there, it's easy to price. I know exactly what we're going to buy and the size of it and where it's all going to go. Um, there's typically other details that get included and that would, that would be how the, the bed is prepared, right? So we will 
build our landscapes to the BC landscape uh, industry standard. Uh, so if there's if there's trees going in, they minimal planting depth would be 18 inches for those. And then herbaceous is more like a foot. So often the beds in the middle will be deeper than uh, along the edge. But it takes a lot of resources, as you can imagine, um, in terms of soil to start building this up. Now, this is, you know, in more of the ideal situation where you, you have a client who's got resources that can afford to, to prepare this properly, right? So this would not, uh, this bed right here would never have happened without that initial excavation because that was a driveway. It was a parking area. It was all gravel. It was all compacted. Um, so that would be really hard to build soil on. Now, this area over here uh, was a turf area. So you could start building soil over there um, without having to go through this drastic excavation process. But typically, um, we will excavate, we will, we will put aside all the material we want to save, all the good soil, and either relocate or uh, take off site any of the fill that comes out, like all the fill that came out of this area that was all, it was just all rock and gravel. Uh, it had to be taken elsewhere. It's not usable on the job site. So that is uh, a little bit um, of a side note on this whole process. So <clears throat> what I would like to do, I'm going to just take you onto some pictures here. Sorry, I'm just going through my photos, trying to find what I'm looking for. That's what happens when you have too many years of experience. Your, <laughs> your library gets huge. All right. All right, so this is an example of a uh, landscape we designed and built. And we did this landscape uh, under that first approach that I was talking about, where none of this was pre-planned, except there's an enormous wall that you don't really see at the back here. It's about 250 feet long, and it's about eight foot high. It's a uh, dry stacked wall. Beautiful, beautiful wall. Be there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, so all this was um, conceptually laid out, right, in our concept plan, but we didn't have all these individual plants. So we just brought in truckload after truckload of material, and we started with these big trees, and then we went to larger shrubs, and then we started working on these edges. And, uh, you know, that's a, a little bit of a, a tip for you in terms of how we, <clears throat> how we, um, do our planting. I, I've seen, and I know I'm, I'm kind of going a little bit ahead, but I thought it might be a, a valuable bit of info for, for some of you. But I have seen a lot of people, and there's no right or wrong. It's whatever works uh, for the individual. But when I'm doing a layout and planting, the first thing we do is the trees. We just lay out trees and plant them, and then take a step back and look because that's our main structure, right? We want to make sure we have the main structure where we want it. So we can jostle those around if needed. And then we go to the big shrubs and we do that. And we make sure that we've got our structure covered. Then after that, we start doing these big ornamental grasses, these really tall herbaceous plants that are... Um, very dynamic in the landscape. So they're going to come and go in seasonally, right? So they're going to 
have a beautiful look in the summer, and then they're going to start to go down in the winter time. And that's kind of how we move through the landscape when we're planting it. Uh, I couldn't do it any other way. Uh, well, I guess I could. But I wouldn't want to do it any other way because I want to make sure that we're, we're covering off some of these main elements and, and doing it that in that order really works for me. Other people will uh, take their plants and they'll lay them all out all at once and then start planting. And uh, it's not that it may very well work for, for many of you on the call. Uh, it just isn't something that really works well for me. So, and part of that is, uh, let's say you, you have chosen that route and you've planted a big area and you realize, oh my gosh, I'm one, uh, I should have put one more tree in this planting. So to do that, you're going to have to undo a whole lot of work. And that's the primary reason I don't like doing that. I don't want to be spending more time than necessary. Um, in this particular project, this was probably a couple acres of planting that we did. So every day, uh, we had three hours of travel every day to get to and from the site. And we'd spend all day planting once it, this was all prepared. And it was brutal. It was very, very tiring. So having to undo anything um, day after day, it, it, it's tough. So it's a fun job and won lots of awards, but it... Uh, it uh, it was very difficult. Here's kind of a, uh, that's a before. That's what we started with. And then that's sort of uh, standing on top of this wall, looking back up. It's just a very big park-like setting. And if I was doing it today, I would do it very differently. There's no doubt of that. This, uh, you know, this is a job I did 25 years ago. Um but is lots of fun. And uh, there's the wall I was speaking of. This is a uh, beautiful, um, beautiful work by a number of craftsmen that were on this project and uh, not a speck of concrete anywhere. It's all dry set and you do not see this very often. That's not anymore anyways. All right, so that's a little bit about that. Um, I want everybody to to make sure that they're they're comfortable with the fact that we're going to be addressing just a small space within your landscape at, at, for this exercise. And then when we get to lesson number ten, uh, we'll be doing the the whole thing, right? But do bear in mind. Uh, if we look back at this original example here, and these are all call-outs. So here we have 24 Nepeta Walker low uh, number ones. That's the pot size. We're not going to be asking you to do that. We're not asking you to label your whole drawing in lesson 10, uh, identifying every individual plant. But one day... Uh, as far as your design skills go, you want to be able to do this. So the details are an important um, part of the puzzle here. And uh, with this particular job, we, we did a conceptual plan first, and then that was the end of our design phase. And then the, our clients asked us to, to provide details for construction. So that's when we went to the next step here. Let's see what else we got. These are some smaller areas that we did. Uh, here's an example of just a little planting area that had existing plants in it that you can you may be able to see uh, that are grayed out here and, and they are labeled existing. And this was just an addition to this area, right? So we were leaving the existing trees and shrubs and we were adding some elements to that. Uh -oh. 
I am not sure why that's not moving for me. And this is another detail, but that is uh, neither here nor there. Um, we end up uh, specking this. Um, uh, gosh, it's at the tip of my tongue. Sorry. Huh. Well, we had a we had a a patio surface over here that was much like this, right? So it would infiltrate water, and then this whole parking area was the same. It was built on this geo grid and then had grass on top, right? Pretty, um, it's not what we had originally chosen. The client really wanted to, to look out of the house and have some green space before they saw the garden. So it was an entirely personal, um, personal choice by the, by the homeowner. Uh, originally we had, this is an in, just an infiltrated gravel area. So when it rained, it, the water had somewhere to go as opposed to having uh, this asphalt here. So all the water would come off the asphalt and then infiltrate. All right. Get rid of that. Let me can show you another example here. Ah, sorry, Michelle has a question. So how do you prepare soil when there's an established pasture? Yeah, that's a good question. Is it best to till, tarp, or another way? Yeah, very good question, Michelle. I guess uh, in some ways, um, it would depend on the, the scope, the size of the area. Do you have an approximate size that you'd be looking at? Like, are you talking 10 acres? I know you're not, because I don't think your site's quite that large, but less than an acre. Okay. So if you have pasture, it's already been doing a job, growing, supporting plant material. So you're, you're already off to the races there. Um, what are you hoping to do in that acre? just as a very rough. Vegetable and fruit. So do you want, you want to have uh, some annual veg or maybe some, an orchard or kind of a orchard. Right. Okay. So what I would uh, suggest, let me just go back to, This other screen here. Uh oh. So if you have a large, largish area, one of, and it's pasture, one of the great ways of, we'll call nuking, <laughs> getting rid of that grass is a silage tarp. And we have, we've used it on our property, works very well. Uh, you have to time it correctly. So you'd have to ensure your soil has moisture. So let's say it's early spring and things are starting to move and you've got good soil moisture. You can put down your tarp and what you don't see here is these, there's a whole bunch of uh, rock filled bags or sand filled bags around the edge here. That's how it's being held down. Um, and you leave it there. And let's say you put it down in March, just as things are warming up and moving. I would say by, you know, midsummer, maybe less, uh, you'd be able to pull this back and you'd ha basically have a, uh, a solarized space to work with that's already been, um, you know, all that turf would have been killed off. Now, if you have other nasty perennial weeds in there, you may find you have to do a little bit of uh, follow-up. But once you have this done, you would then want to, um, I would go through it with a broad fork. Now this, this area is pretty big, so it'd take you a little while. 
I would avoid tilling if you can, because tilling is just going to to flip your soil upside down, and you're going to be basically starting over again with soil building. Uh, if you can, if you can broad fork it, that'd be great. Now another option, if you had easy access to a um, a key line plow or a subsoiler, preferably a key line plow, uh, you could rip that area before tarping it. That's what I would do. So when I say rip it, it would end up looking like this. And this is a fabulous tool for reducing compaction in pastures um, without causing too much disturbance on the surface. And some of these, you'll see this one has a wheel on the back, a roller. And the reason for that is if, it, if, you're, if you're running through here decompacting, the roller pushes the turf back down so you can get livestock back out there as soon as possible. Otherwise, you've got little hazards for a bit, but the roller helps. Um, <clears throat> there's all sorts of versions of these. We're very lucky. Yeah, here's a good shot of the roller. There's also people will set up uh, compost tea units on the back and they will have um, hosing coming down the back of the shank. So if we look up, there's a good picture of it there. The shank is really unusual in that it's quite flat. Um, but this hosing comes down the back of the shank. Oops. And obviously this is protected, but uh, you, it then delivers soil biology right to the, right where you want it. When you deliver soil biology on top of the pasture on its own, um, there are a lot of things that uh, can go sideways, right? So let's say you had compost here, compost extract, and you were dumping it. No, I won't say dumping. You're applying it to your pasture. If it was a hot day, it may just all dry up before you're able to irrigate it, right? So moisture is key with the soil biology, uh, getting a good start with that. But yeah, these are brilliant tools. Um, we have one on Vancouver Island that... Uh, uh, we, basically, we rent when we need to use that. Um, some come with three. Three tines. This one has five. So more tines means bigger horsepower on your tractor needed. For to the one we use, I think is three. And it takes about a 50 plus horsepower tractor to run. So basically what we do is we rent the plow. It gets delivered and we find a local... Uh, farmer who's got a tractor that we can hire for a few hours and it's very quick so a couple acres you know it's not even an hour like it's it takes longer to get um, mobilized than it would to uh, do the actual work provided you have nice soils now if you have a bunch of rock and um uh you know, debris that the the shanks lift up, then you end up creating some work for yourself. But um, that's one way of doing it. So silage tarp is definitely... Uh, now, the other thing, if you have pasture and you want to... Uh, let me see if I can find it. Well, I can't spell very well today. Just try and find a nice agroforestry image here. 
So that's probably one of my uh, all-time favorite combinations is pasture with agroforestry, uh, both visually and uh, from a production side. It's amazing. Let me just get back to see if I can find it in this group here. I see I got a question from Kevin I'm going to get to. Okay, this is all about key line design, but that often uh, is what these agroforestry, there's a good uh, example. So, yeah, maybe a little more extreme than you were thinking, Michelle, but it, it, you can, the beauty of this, you can scale it down, scale it up. Uh, the, a key line design was created here as the layout for all of this uh, tree material. And it's all about distributing water evenly. And this is a fairly, you know, early image, but I've seen other images that have been planted, you know, say a decade before. And the, tr the growth is so even across uh, the orchard. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, and it just points to, that's a fairly young planting. But amazing when that you can combine uh, those perennial crops that are just going to get better and better with time. Yeah. So here's another example of that on a smaller scale where they've made, it looks like they've uh, used, they've done some tillage here and created uh, raised beds. And uh, I think what they've done here without knowing is they've got tree crops and they've got berry crops in between. I think that's what they've done here. And then of course they have all these even alleys, right? So this is the beauty of this from a farming perspective. Instead of it being on contour and you're getting different alley widths as you go, uh, these are all even. So in terms of putting uh, animals out on here, if that was the desire, it gets, you know, pretty simple. Other than, of course, having to protect your crops against your, your grazers. Yeah, for, that's one thing I can say for anybody that's uh, uh, farming on a serious level. Uh, the Regrarian platform is a fascinating design sequence to learn. And as you can see here, there's 10 distinct layers going from climate all the way to energy. So, all right. So hopefully, does that help you with your question, Michelle? <laughs> You'll learn as you go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, th that should really help you. Uh, you're very welcome. Kevin, you've got a question. A lot of local no-till veg farmers I know put a layer of compost on top of planting area before footing the... Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Absolutely. Yeah, very good idea. I'm sure they get a lot of... Um, a lot of really good results. You could do the opposite too, but I like that idea. You got more resources under there for all your soil organisms as that turf breaks down. So thank you very much for that, Kevin. That's great. Uh, yeah, silage tarps are excellent other than when you get holes in them. I think the, the worst part about them from our perspective is just uh, rodents getting under them. And uh, when, when that happens, they tend to just chew holes through them instead of looking for a place to get out. So it's a little bit frustrating when that happens, but um, we're not uh, an agricultural operation, so we're not too worried about that. But uh, yeah, that's, that's how I would approach it. Okay. 
Yeah, we should just check out our Q&A document. So we've got a question here from Brooke. The project recommends doing a planting group around fruit trees. Yeah, that's certainly an example, but it could be any tree. Uh, it doesn't have to be fruit trees. How would you scale this down if you're creating a native meadow? Right. Uh, is Brooke on the call? I think I saw her sign in. Are you there, Brooke? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Um, so with your project, just a question for you. You're going to do a meadow. I think that's exciting. Um, a wonderful thing to do. Is it in an old uh, turf area or lawn area that you're converting? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. There's a slope that um, you could say they're attempting to put turf on, but it's not doing very well. Okay. So I'm just wondering, is there another small space on your project site that you'd be putting uh, woody plants in or anything a little different than a meadow? Is there another spot that you could potentially look at for less than eight? That's just, even if it's just a very small little area? I could switch it to somewhere else. I was just curious if the concept of having like a focal plant and then basing everything around that applies to different types of environments or is this mainly just tree, shrub, herbaceous layer, if that well, makes sense. Yeah, that's just uh, the kind of overarching goal of what we're, you know, what you would typically try and do in a landscape area. Now, when you're doing a meadow, yeah, that is a very different approach. And then we're looking at a, a very similar, um, I shouldn't say similar heights, but very similar characteristics, not quite the same dynamic, right? And I'm not uh, reducing <laughs> the importance of a meadow. I think they're incredible. Um, I mean, feel free if you wanted to just do the meadow in lesson eight, you know, go for it. I, I would say go right ahead and do that. If you have another space that you think would work for this exercise, then I'll, I'll entirely leave that up to you. Um, I think in some ways you would get a, a little bit more out of the lesson if you were trying to incorporate more layers in it, because we're, we're not only creating it in that 2D overhead view, but we're going to have a little section detail of whatever you've uh, put together. So, but I'll totally leave that up to you. Yeah, I'm fine either way. Um, yeah, so hopefully that helps you out. <laughs> the non-answer, no, leaving it up to you. <laughs> yes, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so that I think answers all our questions with that. Does anybody on the call have any questions in terms of the, anything we've talked about here? You want to pop in the chat or you could unmute yourself, whatever, whatever works. If not, I can, uh, I can dig up some more examples to Actually, Jimmy, would you be able to go through that example that you showed us? You said you did it 25 years ago and you would do it a lot differently now. Could you tell us how you would approach that now? I can. Yeah, I'll go back to... <clears throat> Okay, well, let's get that photo back. I do like that photo. Um, how would I do that differently? Well, this this was uh, this was way back in nineteen. Hmm. Uh, probably just before the year two thousand, somewhere in there. So it was before my permaculture days, although I was totally. 
you know, my wife and myself were all about organic landscape practices. Um, so we just didn't have the whole picture that permaculture provides um, in terms of resources and stuff. So this landscape, which you can't really see, you, you know, you're only seeing part of it, was really geared uh, heavily on ornamental grasses and kind of to have a very wild look because we're on a hundred acre organic farm here and this farm owner basically inherited her father's, um, her father passed. He, he was a shipbuilder, built most of the ferries for BC ferries where I live. And so he was fairly um, affluent and she uh, was a poor farmer and all of a sudden had all this uh, money. And the first thing she did was build a new barn. And I think you, I think there's an image or re renovated her existing barn. It's somewhere here. There it is. Just up here. Anyway, she renovated that and then decided, you know, the, the landscape be was a, a project. This was an old pasture. And they had dug a very large pond and they dumped all the clay on this pasture and just annihilated it, basically. It was just completely destroyed when we started. But what would I do differently? Uh, if I was doing this today, this would be, uh, and this is providing the client wanted this, right? <laughs> uh, that's the caveat. Um, in, back in this day, I was doing what I did and people would hire us because this is kind of what we did. Whereas nowadays we are doing whatever it is our client desires uh, outside of maybe um, modern uh, gardens. I, I would have a harder time. I could do it, but it, was, it wouldn't be quite, uh, quite the same. So if I was doing this today, I would, have an emphasis on edible, medicinal landscape. You know, everything here would have some landscape value or some medicinal value to it. Um, we also did a hedgerow on this property. And I wish that that's the one thing I wish I could redo because I've gone through, I took a hedgerow course with Jude Hobbs uh, last year and, um, you know, this is basically 40 years into the trade, uh, learning new things and thinking, damn, I wish I had that in my, under my belt when I was doing it. Um, so those are two things I would do differently. Uh, I wouldn't have as much plant material, probably less, uh, less plants, um, have to create more access for harvesting. And in this case, there's basically no access for, for anything like that, because in this type of a setting where it's mainly, we're not worried about harvesting anything. There's very little, there's very little soil showing we don't need to. And this is only like a year, year and a half after planting, right? So it's gone through one season of establishment and it's exploding, right? And that's what we expect. This is how all the landscapes we do uh, respond. Uh, good soil, uh, healthy plants coming in, but the the main thing is the uh, compost. At the after we planted, we apply the highest quality compost we can find, and um, and then ensure the irrigation is there to follow. Right. So, yeah, I just wouldn't plant this again. Uh, I love a lot of those plants in this landscape, but yeah, it's just a different time in my history. So I'm, I'm far more like in my own landscape at home, my wife and myself, uh, our garden would have didn't resemble this totally, but it was that theme. It was really bold and lots of foliage and, uh, ornamental, you know, it was for us, it was to, it was for aesthetic, uh, return. Whereas now we need to get 
a yield off of our plants. And aesthetic is a yield, but we need food because <laughs> of food security. So our, our garden now is totally geared towards habitat, food, and medicine. But it can look very similar to this. It doesn't have to look remarkably different. It just depends on what you choose to, to place uh, in the garden. And that takes a long time to get to know all the plants, right? That's, that's probably the biggest thing. I spent a decade just learning plants. And then, uh, then I could go and do this, right? Because I knew what I was working with. If you don't know what you're working with, it's, it, it is hard. It's really hard. But you have to start somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, in some ways, uh, I had a few little projects and then boom, onto these monster jobs. And uh, uh, that was hard. Um, so Brooke has one more question. Ah, okay. I think I answered your question, Brooke. Yeah, so if I was doing a client interview of myself, I would certainly say, well, I want uh, lots of habitat, I, but I want lots of uh, a food and medicine yield. So that's my priority in our own landscape. And I would put another caveat into that and say, I want to uh, apply the least amount of water that I have to. So that um, plays into rain gardens and what uh, Brad Lancaster would call pit plantings, uh, you know, creating fertile depressions that collect water but aren't going to be overwhelmed by winter water. That's the tricky, tricky balance um, that we kind of play on the Pacific Northwest here, whereas Brad's in Tucson, Arizona, and they get, you know, intense rain events and then nothing for a while. So here we get months of, of wet weather and then then we get months of dry. So it, it's, it is tricky. Um, so I, I hope I somewhat answered your question, Brooke. Yeah, so I think we're at the end of our hour here. Is there anything else anybody would like to ask um, regarding lesson number eight? Happy to answer it. No? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me today. It's always great to chat with all of you and have these excellent questions uh, thrown my way. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, everybody has a, a, a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing your uh, lesson eight assignments when you have them done. And if you do run into any problems or any challenges during the week, just pop me a note and I'd be more than happy to help you work through that. So, yeah. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, have, have yourself a great week and we'll be checking in with you next, uh, next Monday. So take care.